several questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The $500 billion in inflationist deficits have caused the highest levels of inflation in 40 years now. Canadians are cutting um, uh, to be able to afford food, and uh, young people have to live in their parents' basements. The economic update will give the government uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, cancel these inflationary policies. But is it not ironic that the things that the government is going to have to do to address this crisis are cancelling 100 percent of what they've done for seven years. The Honourable Minister of Tourism. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to inflation, we have a concrete plan. Reducing daycare costs for families, doubling the GST tax credit, giving uh, $500 for housing, and offering dental support for 500,000 young Canadians. Mr. Speaker, what's ironic is that when they had the opportunity to vote for Canadians, they voted against Canadians. Chef de Lopez. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Honourable Leader Mark Carney has said that inflation is domestically generated. So is the so has the current Governor of the Bank of Canada. And now, after a half trillion dollars of inflationary deficits, the Finance Minister is pretending that she believes, like Conservatives, that government spending is driving this crisis in the first place. Isn't it ironic that the solution to the problem the government will have to pursue that wants to make life more affordable is to do exactly the opposite of what they have been doing for the last seven years? <laughs> the Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, on inflation, our government is taking concrete steps to reduce child care fees. And in my own province, it's over $6,000 for average for family, doubling the GST credit, providing a one-time $500 payment for renters. And Mr. Speaker, 500,000 kids will get dental coverage that they never had before. What's ironic in this House, Mr. Speaker, is that when the Conservatives had the chance to vote for Canadians, they voted against, we voted for them. Leader of the Opposition. None of what they've done has actually worked. This week we found out 20% of Canadians are skipping meals or cutting portions to afford groceries. In fact, 1.5 million Canadians are visiting, have been, in one month, visited the food bank. And finally, speaking of food banks, the one at Jane and Finch actually got kicked out of its location because rent doubled. How much pain will Canadians have to suffer before this government can stops its inflationary policies? Yeah. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we understand that times are tough for Canadians, and that's why our government, since we've been in office in 2015, has lifted 2 million people out of poverty. We know that it's not enough. We know that there's more to do. And that begs the question, Mr. Speaker, why did the Conservatives vote against vulnerable kids who just wanted to get their teeth looked at? Why did they vote against people who needed a $500 top-up on their housing? Why did they vote against child care? And, Mr. Speaker, we know they can't wait to cut it up. We are always going to stand on the side of Canadians. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. According to a Bloomberg Nanos poll, the largest share of Canadians in recorded history say they are worse off than a year ago. What did the NDP do as a solution to that? They voted to raise home heating bills. Yes, them along with their costly coalition partners and the Liberal Party voted twice to make home heating more expensive by tripling, tripling and tripling the carbon tax. The Liberals understand that the purpose of the carbon tax is to make home heating more expensive. Will they tell the NDP that that is, in fact, the plan? <laughs> the Honourable Minister for Immigration. Mr. Speaker, I can tell you it's nice to take a question from my friend opposite once again. But I've got to say, as an Atlantic Canadian, it really burns me to see this line of questioning. We're dealing with neighbours that I've got right now who've lost over six figures in corn crops that they're trying to feed their cattle. We've seen silos come down. We've seen wharves damaged. And we know that when we put a price on pollution, it puts more money in the pockets of eight out of ten Canadian families. If they want to be uh, laggards when it comes to climate action, they're free to do so, but they shouldn't be so committed to taking money from my neighbours while they do it. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, the carbon tax is not a climate plan. It is a tax plan. It, they have not hit a single solitary climate change target since they took office. And now 
They want to not double down, but triple down on their failure by tripling, tripling, and tripling the carbon tax as we go into a winter when analysts expect that heating costs will go up 100% and more for families in that member's riding who heat their homes with oil. Mr. Speaker, will the costly coalition, including the NDP, finally reverse themselves so the Canadians can keep the heat on? Yeah. The Honourable Minister. With respect to the allegation that our plan to put a price on pollution is a tax on Canadian households, he knows it's bogus. Year after year after year, he's been making this point in the House of Commons, and year after year after year, it's proven to him that Canadians actually receive more from a dividend than they put out on pricing. The reality is this is one amongst many measures of our climate plan. We know that it's the right thing to do, and we're seeing it in my community, because right now, it's very clear the cost of inaction is far greater than the cost of taking action. We're going to do the right thing, both by the environment and the bottom line of Canadian households. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, on Thursday, the Toronto Star revealed the federal government's strategy when it comes to health transfers and it confirms our worst fears. The Prime Minister refuses to meet with his counterparts in Quebec and the provinces as long as they're unanimous in asking for $28 billion in increases and an indexation at 6%. He wants to break the provinces. He wants to negotiate uh, one uh, individually with the provinces that are going to break and force them to abandon uh, their asks and accept his conditions. It's dividing to rule, Mr. Speaker. Our hospitals are overflowing. Why is the government working to make sure the provinces don't get the money they need? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my colleague is speaking about division, but no, we are all united. All uh, the health ministers and myself uh, are united, and we are working for the same people. We are working with the same dollars. We all want to invest to support our health care workers who need that support, given the difficult uh, conditions uh, we're facing right now. And we're going to take care of all Canadians, no matter where they are. The Honourable uh, Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, we know why they're playing this game. They're so arrogant, they've even told journalists about it. They're playing these games because they want to isolate Quebec. They want to break the provinces. They want to make them walk on glass and abandon the $28 billion that they need to meet their health care needs. They're just going to give us crumbs. All that so they can come to Quebec afterwards and say, well, this is the agreement, take it or leave it. This is predatory federalism, Mr. Speaker. Are the Liberals aware that this is called blackmail and that they're blackmailing uh, on the backs of sick Canadians? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Not only are we all united on the importance of acting for our health care workers and for patients who need help, but also the federal government is going to do its part. It's been doing that for years with the $72 billion in additional uh, money on, on top of uh, the transfers. And these investments continue, Mr. Speaker, uh, with rapid tests, vaccines, Paxlovid, and uh, personal protective uh, equipment. All of that is still underway because the pandemic uh, continues, along with the $2 billion to reduce uh, uh, surgery wait times and diagnostic wait times. And I could continue to speak about that, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, while rich CEOs of the big grocery stores are filling their pockets, people have to choose between paying rent or paying for food. One person in five is skipping a meal to reduce their grocery bill, and demand is exploding in food banks. That's where we're at, Mr. Speaker. The Liberals uh, are letting uh, these greedy companies uh, force Canadians into making impossible choices. People are hungry, and CEOs don't care. In their economic update, will the Liberals finally make rich CEOs pay their fair share, or do they not care either? The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. Mr. Speaker, my colleague knows very well what we've done. He doesn't need to politicize this question. Everybody here in this House wants to make life more affordable for Canadians. Mr. Speaker, my colleague knows very well that it's not just today that we've started to be interested in this. I wrote to the Competition Bureau last May, Mr. Speaker, asking them to use all the tools at their disposal to make sure that uh, uh, the, the grocery stores are acting properly. Last week, I called for an investigation, and I've spoken to a number of these CEOs from across the country to tell them to do their fair share. Everyone has to do their part to help families, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Elmwood Trends, Kona. Mr. Speaker, prices are now so bad that 20% of Canadian families are skipping meals to cut down on food costs. And as interest rates continue to rise, 
Canadians need their government to act to reduce costs. In the fall economic statement, they have an opportunity to do that. They can make it easier to prosecute grocery price fixers. They can implement a windfall profit tax to ensure big companies aren't using inflation as an excuse for highway robbery. Mm -hmm. It took this government six months to take the NDP's advice and double the GST tax credit. Yep. So how long is it going to take this time for the Liberals to see the light and implement these simple, helpful measures? Here, here. The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. Mr. Speaker, there's no, there's no need to bring politics in something that concerns all Canadians. Everyone in this House, Mr. Speaker, wanted to do their part to bring price downs for Canadians. Mr. Speaker, it's not yesterday we look at that. I wrote to the Competition Bureau back in May of this year, Mr. Speaker, asking them to use all the tools at their disposal to make sure there was no unlawful practice in the market. And more recently, I asked for an investigation, Mr. Speaker. I spoke to the CEOs of a number of these chains around the country. Mr. Speaker, everyone needs to do their part to help Canadian families in times like that. The Honourable Member for Calgary Forest Lawn. Mr. Speaker, Liberal inflation has one in five Canadians skipping or cutting back on meals, with more families pushed to food banks. Liberals will punish Canadians further by triple, triple, tripling the carbon tax on home heating, groceries and gas. Meanwhile, this Prime Minister sings in luxurious hotels abroad and spends in four nights what an average family spends in a whole year on rent. Canadians can't afford this costly coalition anymore. When will the Liberals stop pile-driving Canadians deeper into debt, stop inflationary spending and stop raising taxes? The Honourable Minister for Tourism. The rebates that Canadians get, more eight out of ten Canadians get more money back. And in my own home province of Alberta, almost $1,100 a year comes back to them. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, our plan on affordability, building on all the work we did in the spring, continues here into the fall. Dental supports for half a million kids, doubling the GST, $500 in rental supports. Mr. Speaker, we voted with Canadians. Conservatives voted against. Honourable Member for Calgary, Forest Lawn. If things were as great as the Liberals say they are, then why are almost 50% of Canadians saying their finances haven't been this bad in a decade? 40-year high in Liberal homegrown inflation caused by the costly coalition is pushing more seniors, more children and more workers into food banks and skipping meals. Even future Liberal leader candidate Mark Carney doesn't believe the Liberals saying inflation is a global issue. He knows it's a Liberal made issue. Will the Liberals do the right thing? Stop the pain, stop the empty words, stop the spending, and stop raising taxes. The Honourable Minister for Seniors. Mr. Speaker, we recognize the challenges that Canadians and seniors are facing with paying their bills and for their groceries, Mr. Speaker. That's precisely why we've been there for them. Mr. Speaker, that's why we've doubled the GST credit, putting more money into the pockets, pockets of uh, Canadians, Mr. Speaker. That's exactly why we're helping them with rental uh, and dental support, Mr. Speaker. That's why we actually increased the old age security by 10% for those 75 and over, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, we'll continue to deliver for all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. How many more Canadian families have to visit food banks in this country? How many more young couples will have to give back their keys because they can't pay their mortgages? How many seniors will have to cut back on the necessity of heating their homes before these Liberals and their costly coalition partnership with the NDP wake up to what's going on in Canada? Will they stop? the taxes? Will they stop punishing Canadians? Will they commit to stopping their planned tax increases and their tripling of the carbon tax? Yeah. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, let's look at the Conservative record on taxes. In 2015, when we lowered taxes on the middle class, the Conservatives voted against. When we voted for the child care benefit, Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives voted against. When we created the Canada Worker Benefit, Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives voted against. When we lowered taxes on small businesses, how did the Conservatives vote? They voted against. And what did they do last week, Mr. Speaker? Instead of supporting Canadians who needed the help the most, the Conservative bench voted against. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. The inflationary spending is the cause of the pain for almost every Canadian, while Liberals pretend that everything is fine. Remember, they told Canadians that interest rates would stay low. They told Canadians that the problem would be deflation, not inflation. We were told then that all of this was temporary so that the government can continue to spend and spend. They told us that they would take on the debt so Canadians wouldn't have to. What else are they going to get wrong? The Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, I think we need to roll the tape back in this House to the time when the House was discussing on hybrid Parliament how this government, this Parliament, would support Canadians in the worst pandemic in 100 years. And this government had bold proposals to make sure that wage subsidies and individual subsidies for people would be able to keep them in their homes. How did the Conservatives vote? They voted with us. Mr. Speaker, are they now saying they wish they would have taken those votes back and not had the CERB and not kept businesses afloat? I think the Conservatives need to tell Canadians what their plan is, because we certainly have one. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, the Finance Minister is contradicting her Prime Minister when she says the government needs to tighten its belt and cut spending. Even future Liberal leader Mark Carney uh, contradicts him when he says that inflation in Canada is a problem caused by Liberal management. And even if the Finance Minister wants to control spending, she's under pressure from the costly coalition, the NDP and the Liberals, who are working together to continue with these inflationary spending policies. Will the Minister commit to stopping these tax increases and to stop inflationary spending? The, right, uh, the Honourable Minister. Let's be clear, when it comes to the Conservatives' record on taxes for Canadians, in 2015, when we lowered taxes for Canadians, the Conservatives voted against. When we created the Canada Child Benefit, the Conservatives voted against. When we put in place a plan for workers, the Conservatives once again voted against that. Last week, once again, Mr. Speaker, they voted against. Our, our plan is to vote for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Gaut saint charles Mr. Speaker, we will always vote for what is best for Canadians. And every time the Liberals uh, bring measures that will create economic uh, problems, such as inflation uh, and higher interest rates, you know, we're always going to vote against that. They're spending $200 uh, billion dollars out of $500 billion they've spent, which the Parliamentary Budget Officer has confirmed has nothing to do with pandemic help. The Liberals can talk, 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 but when it's time to act for real for Canadians and for the economy, they're lost. When will this government uh, uh, stop with its inflationary spending? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's clear that the plan that we put in place in the pandemic helped Canadians get through the worst pandemic in 100 years. The Conservatives voted with us then, but now they want to revise history and they're welcome to do that. But right now we have a concrete plan for inflation, $500 to help with uh, uh, rent, with a dental plan for children, and with the doubling of the GT, uh, GST uh, tax credit. Uh, the Conservatives don't want to know anything about that, but we know Canadians want to know about that, and that's what we're doing. The Honourable Member for Avignon, Lamitis Matin, Matapedia. Mr. Speaker, it's going to be uncomfortable to be in the room next week when Canada uh, comes into the room at COP27. The UN has just published another report proving that uh, uh, various countries' climate change plans are uh, driving us straight into a wall. At the same time, Canada announced in Washington that it was going to be accelerating oil and gas products to export more to Europe. Does the government not realize that it's the fight against climate change that we uh, need to accelerate and not climate change itself? Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question and her uh, commitment to uh, climate action. And, Mr. Speaker, I just want to remind her that we have the most ambitious climate change plan in the history of Canada, $100 billion uh, invested since 2015, $9.1 billion in the Emissions Reduction Plan. And, Mr. Speaker, it's an ambitious sector-by-sector -sector pathway to get to our 2030 targets on our way to uh, net zero by 2050. It has broad support from environmental groups, industry, farmers in Quebec and across the country, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Avignon, Lamitis Matin, Matapedia. Mr. Speaker, the Minister could have said that they're aware of the UN report and that they won't approve any new oil and gas product projects. At minimum, he could have said that he wasn't going to accelerate them. But no, imagine, the Minister went on the TV last week to explain how he, as a Minister of the Environment, can help oil and gas companies get through the evaluation process more quickly. Mr. Speaker, in the middle of a climate crisis, is it the role of an environment minister to help industry approve their oil and gas projects? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, the world must meet the challenge of the climate crisis. This is something that we must absolutely do for our children and our grandchildren.
And obviously, Canada has put in place a plan to fight climate change. It's maybe the most detailed plan in the entire world. Obviously, we need to have a strong economy, but we also need to face climate change, and that's exactly what we're doing. The Honourable Member for Evignon Lamitis, Matane Matapedia. Mr. Speaker, at COP27, all the countries that are there are going to be talking about the actions they've taken since the last conference to fight climate change. When Canada speaks, our allies are going to remember that since the last COP, Canada approved Bay du Nord and its billion barrels of oil. They're also going to remember that they announced in Washington that uh, they're going to approve other projects like Bay du Nord, and they even want to accelerate them. Does the minister not realize that uh, worse than coming to COP uh, with empty hands, Canada is going to be coming with dirty hands? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, we know that we must meet the challenge of the climate crisis. We need to be a leader in these circumstances. And I want to say that around the world, there aren't many uh, countries that have a detailed plan like Canada's, but we also need to have a plan for the economy. We need to be prosperous for our children and for the future, and we are going to work to do both of those things. Well, member for Sturgeon River Parkland. Mr. Speaker, the minister has repeatedly claimed that neither he nor his staff ever requested the RCMP commissioner to reveal confidential evidence. He claims that he never asked for letters of support from independent police to provide political cover for the use of the Emergencies Act. And yet the RCMP commissioner clearly knew that the minister was seeking these letters, and evidence shows that she was working with him to reveal confidential evidence about the Nova Scotia mass shooting. Does the minister expect us to believe that the RCMP commissioner acted alone? The Honourable President of the Privy Council. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, there's a, there's a very significant problem with the member's theory, which is based entirely on speculation, innuendo, and conjecture. And, but, Mr. Speaker, he ignores the facts, and here are the facts. Mr. Speaker, at no time did I or the government attempt to interfere in police operations. I did not direct, ask, or even suggest to the Commissioner that she release that information. And the Commissioner herself has testified under oath that I did not receive direction, I was not influenced by government officials regarding the public release of information. Mr. Speaker, those are simply the facts. Well, member for Sturgeon River Parkland. Well, we've received email evidence from his office that suggests otherwise. Audio recordings and text messages from the RCMP commissioner confirm this disturbing pattern. The Minister of Emergency Preparedness has repeatedly crossed the line, interfering in a police investigation and politicizing our independent police forces, all to provide political cover for this Liberal government. The evidence against the minister is piling up. It's no wonder that the commissioner is looking for a new messaging app to permanently delete messages. The minister keeps denying, but the facts say otherwise. When will the minister finally come clean? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I've said a number of times in this House, the independence of police operations is a key principle in our democracy. It's one that our government respects. But, Mr. Speaker, I simply remind this House, uh, in, in May of 2020, the, the member from uh, Lee Grenville, Thousand Islands, rose in this House and demanded to know why the government wasn't releasing information on search warrants, production orders, and closed warrants related to the, ma the, the Nova Scotia massacre. And at that time, Mr. Speaker, I, I was forced to rise in the House and explain to that Conservative member, and I, as I I would did to all members that our government does not interfere with ongoing criminal investigations and the RCMP are responsible for the information that he sought. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, here are the uncontestable facts. In a conversation 10 years after the tragic incident, here's what the Commissioner said to her colleagues. She confirmed that uh, there had been a political interference in the ongoing investigation. First, she said, I had a conversation with the minister and I said that it would be in the communique and it wasn't. Second, she said, did you know that the government is working on a, a, a weapons bill right now? And she said, third, I'm waiting for a phone call from the prime minister to apologize. One, two, three. Why does the minister continue with this cover-up? The Honourable Minister. Contrary, Mr. Speaker, I've risen in this House a number of times and simply repeated the truth to the members. I'm not going to speculate on a conversation of which I was not a party. I can simply advise this House, at no time 
Did I direct, ask, or even suggest to the minister, to the, the commissioner of the RCMP, that she should release any information pertaining to this investigation and under oath before the Mass Casualty Commission? The commissioner has confirmed that she was not directed by myself or any government official, and that on, with respect to the release of information or in the conduct of, in, of the investigation. Mr. Speaker, those are simply facts. The Honourable Member for Victoria. Mr. Speaker, this weekend, the Environment Minister criticized oil and gas companies for paying out huge profits to their shareholders instead of taking climate action. But it's hard to believe this minister's fake outrage when the Liberals are still handing out billions of dollars to big oil, all while these corporations rake in record profits. The minister won't put a windfall tax on these excess profits to invest in climate action and to make life more affordable. Will the minister finally stand up to big oil by making them pay what they owe? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member uh, for the question. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, we know two things uh, for certain. Oil and gas emissions must come down and that uh, energy companies are making record profits. And like us, Mr. Speaker, energy companies must put their shoulder to the wheel and begin uh, investing in in uh, pollution uh, reduction, Mr. Speaker. We need to work together to create the clean economy and the good jobs of today and tomorrow. And Mr. Speaker, we'll be with them every step of the way as we uh, meet our 2030 targets on our way to net zero by 2050. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. So big oil has racked up their highest profits ever, and that's no surprise to Canadians who are getting gouged at the pump. So how is big oil spending their loot? Well, stock buybacks, payouts to investors, automation as they lay off thousands of energy workers. As for climate action, not a chance. They want the taxpayers to pick up the bill. So when is the Environment Minister going to stop acting as an ATM for the oil lobby and hold them to account? When is he going to make the investments necessary in a clean energy transformation that doesn't leave Canadian workers behind. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would advise the Honourable Member perhaps to actually read the Emissions Reduction Plan. This, this, uh, this government has invested over $110 billion in reducing emissions around this country and in making investments to actually grow a clean economy on, uh, going forward. It is something that you have to actually think about on both sides of the equation. Yes, we must reduce emissions, but we also have to think about creating jobs and economic opportunity for the future, and that is exactly what we are doing. Outstanding. The Honourable Member for Will Mr. Speaker, yesterday Prime Minister uh, Trudeau stood shoulder to shoulder with protesters. I just want to remind the honourable members that we order, order, order. I just want to remind the honourable members that when we name someone in the chamber, it's by their title or by their writing. The honourable member for Willowdale from the top, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, the Prime Minister stood shoulder to shoulder with protesters who participated in the Freedom Rally against the Iranian regime in Ottawa. As the Prime Minister made clear, our government will not stand idly by as the Iranian government terrorizes its own citizens. The message from our government is also consistent that Iranians have been suffocated for far too long, and we will echo their sentiments. Could the Minister of Foreign Affairs apprise members of this House of the latest measures adopted? The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my colleague from Willowdale for his important question and for his solidarity with the Iranian people. Here, here. Today, Mr. Speaker, we announce a new round of sanctions against the Iranian regime. Those sanctions target senior officials and parliament uh, regime supporters who participated in human rights violations. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to do everything we can to hold the Iranian regime accountable for its oppression and brutality, because, Mr. Speaker, impunity is not an option. Here, Thank here. you. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you. Well, the verdict is in. The evidence is clear. The cost of government is driving up the cost of living. The Prime Minister's own parliamentary budget officer said that of the new spending, 40% of it was not related to COVID. 
Liberal leadership uh, members seem to agree, uh, which is Mark Carney recently said, inflation is now primarily a Canadian event. Even the deputy leader said, whether new religion of, of uh, fiscal restraint seems to agree. Does the Prime Minister agree? The Honourable Minister for Tourism. Mr. Speaker, let's be clear what the Conservatives are saying. They are saying that they wouldn't have put in place the CERB, which kept millions of Canadians in their homes. They wouldn't have had the wage subsidy, which kept 60,000 businesses operating just in the energy sector alone in Alberta. They wouldn't have had the rent subsidy, which helped... I'm just going to interrupt for a second. I'm having a hard time hearing. And when I can't, under, I can't hear his voice, I know there's a problem in the chamber. So I'm going to ask all of you to keep it down. He has a, a voice that really carries the Honourable Minister, and it's appreciated. But let's give him the chance so that we can hear his response. The Honourable Minister from the top, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Let's be clear about what the Conservatives are saying, and they don't like us telling Canadians what they're actually saying. What they're saying is that they would have scrapped the CERB, that they would not have had the wage supports, that they would not have had supports for businesses, 60,000 energy businesses in my province of Alberta alone. The Conservatives want to cut. They're unhappy that they supported us when they did. They're trying to revise history. Mr. Speaker, we are going to focus on Canadians who need the help the most, when they need it the most, that is our job, and we will do our job. Honourable Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Let me set the record straight, Mr. Speaker. What Conservatives stand against is high inflation, the leading to the highest food bank usage, a third of which are, ki are children. That's what Conservatives stand yeah, yeah, against. Yeah. Don't believe me? Ask the Governor of the Bank of Canada, who said high inflation is leading to hard times for Canadians, particularly the most vulnerable in our communities. Will these Liberals stop their inflationary spending, cancel their planned tax hikes on groceries, gas and home eating? Yeah. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Conservative plan is just to cut. What is their plan? Our plan, Mr. Speaker, we've lowered taxes on Canadians five times in our mandate. We have an affordability plan that's going to help families. Mr. Speaker, if the honourable member on the other side wanted to help kids, 500,000 children in this country, they should have done the right thing and voted for dental supports last week when they had the chance. The honourable member for Sukutumi the Fjord. Mr. Speaker, with liberal inflation, Canadians are curtailing their lifestyles. Their paychecks no longer allow them to live suitably. And what's worse, for some, their paycheck doesn't even allow them to eat enough. We recently learned that Canadians went to food banks 1.5 million times in a single month, a 35% increase over 2019. Here in Canada, in an industrialized country like ours, it's unacceptable. When will the Liberals stop making Canadians poor? The Honourable Minister, despite the fact that Canada has one of the lowest inflation rates in uh, similar countries, it is still difficult for Canadians these days. The other side just wants to cut. What do they want to do? They wanted us to cut back during the pandemic. They wanted to cut, uh, they voted against the wage subsidy and uh, supports for business. Mr. Speaker, we support Canadians. We did it during the pandemic and we'll continue to do so. The Honourable Member for Shakutami the Fjord. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have to stop blaming global conditions. They attacked Canadian energy and now the price of gas is almost $2 a litre and winter isn't even here yet. The former head of the Bank of Canada, Mark Carney, recently told a Senate committee that inflation is now being generated domestically by the government of Canada. Inflation is now a, a domestic problem, a Canadian problem. Will the government commit today not to raise any taxes? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know full well that inflation is caused by the illegal war in Ukraine by the Russians, by disrupted supply chains, and by the zero COVID policy in China. That doesn't help Canadians. What does help Canadians is our affordability plan, our support for dental care for kids and rental support. The Conservatives voted against it. We voted for it. Who's supporting Canadians, Mr. Speaker? Our government is. The Honourable Member for Terres de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, with three days to go before the government's economic update, all signs point to a looming recession. 
the government must remember that the best economic stabilizer in a recession is employment insurance, provided, of course, that workers who lose their jobs are covered. If nothing changes, six out of ten workers will fall through the cracks. Comprehensive EI reform was urgently needed already. It will be even more urgent if there's a recession. Will the economic update finally include EI reform? The Honourable Minister of Employment. Mr. Speaker, we understand that EI has to be accessible and fair for Canadian workers, and that's why we're modernizing the system. It's essential for a worker for EI to be there for them and that it remains there for our workers. The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, if there's a recession with the current EI program, six out of ten workers will be left behind. Six out of ten, Mr. Speaker. We've been through this already during the pandemic. The CERB had to be created because the government realized it couldn't just look the other way when 60 percent of workers lost their jobs. If there is a recession, we could end up in the exact same situation, and that would be embarrassing because you could see it coming this time. Will EI reform be added to the economic update? The Honourable Minister that employment insurance has not kept up with the way Canadians work, and that's why access and adequacy are key fundamental principles that we're building into a modernized approach to employment insurance. I look forward to revealing the government's plan to modernize uh, the steps we will take to make sure every worker continues to have access, fair access across the country, no matter where they live. The Honourable Member for Lethbridge. Whether it's home heating, groceries, or gasoline, Canadians are finding it extremely difficult just to be able to make ends meet. And while I'm concerned for all Canadians, there is one group in particular that has my heart, and that is those who live on a fixed income. Because at the end of the day, as prices go up, they don't have the ability to create a, a greater income for themselves, which puts them in a place of trouble. And many are living on the edge of poverty, which is not okay. So my question is very simple, and that is this. Will the Liberals demonstrate a bit of compassion today and commit to stopping their out-of-control inflationary spending spree and stop their punitive tax hikes on those who are finding it hard to make ends? The Honourable Minister for Seniors. Facts. The fact is, when the Conservative Party was in power, their plan for seniors was to raise the age of retirement to 67. Yes, the first thing we did, Mr. Speaker, we rever re reversed that back to 65. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, the party opposite of opposed every single measure that we put forward to support seniors. The increase to the GIS, the increase to the old age security it. by 10 percent, our enhancements mm -hmm. to the CPP, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we've just moved forward on doubling the GST credit with the payments going out this Friday. We're moving forward forward on rental and dental support, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, we're going to continue to deliver for Canadians, including seniors. The Honourable Member for Lethbridge. I don't think there is much hope in there for Canadians, so let me ask again. It's no secret that Canadians are struggling to be able to make ends meet. Just putting healthy food on their table is a struggle. We know that the number of Canadians going to food banks is skyrocketing. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister has no problem jet-setting around the world or spending $6,000 a night on hotel rooms. So again, I would ask Ask, please come back down to reality. Would this government stop its punitive tax hikes and its out of control inflationary spending in order to make sure that Canadians can afford to live? The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and indeed uh, across the world. Uh, the problem of making ends meet and paying bills is being felt profoundly. What is irresponsible is to say that those are struggling. Uh, that you're going to amplify their fears and anxieties, uh, that you're going to mislead them about their situation. And let's talk about inflation. When Canada has one of the lower rates in the world on inflation, that isn't acceptable. That doesn't pay, 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 pay the bills. But I'll tell you what, what does is concrete actions on affordability. What doesn't help, uh, Mr. Speaker, is amplifying an anxiety and giving no answers. And unfortunately, that's what we hear from the other side. The Honourable Member for Simcoe North. Mr. Speaker, it's Halloween and Canadians are spooked. They're spooked by having to pay 28% more for costumes and candy and spooked to this government's indifference about the inflation crisis, which they just wave away as being globally uh, brought into this country. 
except the central bank governor has said inflation is now more of a homegrown problem, and Mark Carney agrees with him, the former central bank governor. So will this government show some compassion, reduce its inflationary spending, and put a pause on its tax hikes? Great point. The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, I've met people in my community who won't take their kids to the grocery store right now because they're afraid that the cashier is going to tell them that they can't afford what's in their cart and they don't want their kids to go through that. We are going to be there to support families in that situation. When they talk about tax hikes, Mr. Speaker, they're talking about programs like the Canada Pension Plan and like EI. There are people in my community who depend on EI when they fall on tough times. There are people who have worked their entire lives to make sure the Canada Pension Plan would allow them to age with dignity and buy groceries in retirement. We will defend low-income families today and every day. It's nice to see that they finally speak to the issues. It would be better if they actually voted for measures to achieve those ends. The Honourable Member, Honourable... The Honourable Member for Chateau-Gay-Lacolle. Mr. Speaker, since her appointment, the Defence Minister has made it clear that we have to build military institutions where every member feels safe, protected and respected. That's why she accepted Ms. Arbour's report in its entirety and immediately stepped up efforts to change the culture within the defense team. Just last week, the minister announced the appointment of an external monitor. Could she tell us a little bit more about the significance of this appointment? The Honorable Minister of National Defense Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Chateau Gay Lacolle for her important question. We've already laid the groundwork for a culture change, for example, by starting to transfer cases to the civilian system. Last week, I appointed Jocelyne Terrien as our external monitor. She will help us ensure that we continue to make solid progress in changing the culture. We are going to continue our efforts and de deliver reforms that will strengthen our institutions for the armed forces. Thank you. Well, member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. The Liberals' reckless spending is driving up the cost of living for Canadians. $6,000 a night for this Prime Minister's hotel room charge to taxpayers. $54 million for the Arrive scam with a complete snow job on who got paid. Meanwhile, folks who are getting their first home heating, oil or propane delivery are afraid they won't be able to afford a mid-winter fill-up. With the costly coalition of these NDP Liberals, food bank use is at an all-time high as Canadians choose between heating and eating. Will these Liberals end their inflationary spending? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government has a fiscally responsible, prudent and targeted plan that's going to put money right in the pockets of Canadians who need it the most. We are not only increasing the Canada workers' benefit, we have doubled the GST, we have a $500 payment going to low-income renters, and we are going to help half a million kids have dental support, probably, possibly, for the first time in their lives. I don't know what it is the Conservatives have against helping kids, Mr. Speaker, yeah. but on our side of the aisle, we've got the backs of Canadians. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we're very much worried about children, including the fact that with record high food bank use, more than a third of those users are children. These Liberals added more than $171,000 of new debt every single minute of the last fiscal year, and half of that spending had absolutely nothing to do with pandemic supports. Canadians are struggling. These Liberals, they're making it worse. They had the NDP cheerleading them on, trying to max out the national credit card. That's what happens when you have unserious, out-of-touch, expensive NDP Liberals who don't care and don't know what Canadians are facing. Canadians cannot afford the cost of coalition. Will they end this inflationary spending? Here, here, here. The Honourable Government House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, I sat in opposition uh, when the party opposite was there, and they did not talk about poverty. Uh, they did not talk about the plight of low-income families. Uh, they had no targets on poverty reduction. This is a government that not only introduced finally targets on poverty reduction, but has exceeded them every single time, lifting more than two million people out of poverty. That isn't enough. We must do more. But the fact that the party opposite is trying to raise anxiety at a moment when we need solutions and answers is problematic. They vote against direct measures to help those in need and then seek at every opportunity to amplify anxiety, and I ask why. 
The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, when this government gave millions of dollars to Loblaws for new fridges, I had convenience stores, florists and small independent food stores calling me asking how they could also apply for a fridge. I had to explain they didn't qualify, they weren't a billion dollar corporation. We don't know who got rich off the Arrive Can app, the app where glitches forced people into quarantine by mistake. Canadians cannot afford this costly coalition. Will the Liberals end their wasteful and inflationary spending? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, we know that uh, 8 out of 10 families will be better off after the climate action rebate. But the member is from uh, B.C., Mr. Speaker, and no one understands climate change better than uh, the residents of B.C. Mr. Speaker, the costs are very, very high. A $6 billion tab for the atmospheric rivers after drought, fires and flood. Mr. Speaker, 600 lives lost in the interior of B.C. The price this is very high, Mr. Speaker. We have a moral obligation to deal with the climate issue and an economic imperative. The Honourable Member for Scarborough Agent Court. Mr. Speaker, as a result of the ongoing conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, my Scarborough Agent Court constituents and beyond are concerned about the 240 deaths and the many destroyed civilian settlements in Armenia. A ceasefire was agreed upon on September 14th. However, recent reports suggest further escalation. Our government announced it will open a full embassy in Armenia, and we are actively engaging with our Armenian partners to strengthen their democracy. Can the Minister of Foreign Affairs update us on the steps we have taken to secure peace in this area and how we are supporting the strengthening of democracy in Armenia? Honourable Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague from Scarborough, I can report for her, her important question and also for her strong advocacy for the Armenian Canadian community. I announced back in June that Canada would be opening a new embassy in Erevan, and this has been long waited by many. This will also allow for our countries to have stronger ties, and we know that there's a lot of instability and security challenges in the region, so Canada will step up and make sure that we are involved in making sure that we have stronger ties and obviously to protect peace and democracy in the region and globally. Thank you so much. The Honourable Member for North Island Powell River. Mr. Speaker, last week a North Island resident told me she is scared for the safety of her family because of the Port Hardy Hospital emergency room closures. There is not enough staff to keep it open. This is a crisis. Canadians can't access public health care. Rural communities have been left behind by underfunding for health care by both Conservative and Liberal governments. Will this government finally listen to the pleas of Campbell or British Columbians for more federal funding for public health care? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, funding public health care in Canada is not only a need, but also an obligation under the Canada Health Act. We know how important it is to millions of Canadians now with the crisis that we see in emergency departments across the country. We also know we need to support access to family health teams because this is a key part of the solution. People need to have access to their family doctors in order to avoid having to go to the emergency room to treat things that should have been treated or prevented before people end up in a hospital. No, the Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, last Friday I asked a question and didn't get an answer from the Parliamentary Secretary, so I'll ask the Minister now. In our writings, we all hear from desperate people who have serious illnesses. All parties unanimously agree that we need to extend financial assistance to these Canadians. In its last budget, the government announced that EI sickness benefits would be extended to 26 weeks. This was supposed to be done by this summer, but unfortunately it hasn't happened yet. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is straightforward. When will it? The Honourable Minister of Employment. Mr. Speaker, I have good news for my colleague. By December, workers will have access to 26 weeks of EI for illness. We're going to extend it from 15 to 26 weeks, and we're very pleased that workers will have more support when they fall sick. That's all the time we have for question period.
We have a point of order from the Honourable Member for Thornton.